living with bears and wolves and moose and elk and people. I mean, wild places draw wild people too. Living in that sort of vortex is really, uh, again, a gift, but it's always been the biggest challenge. Being here in the same place that long, I guess, gives you a chance to realize you need to appreciate what's here and take care of it to make it last. We own the land, but we're just stewards, and it's our obligation to share it with others. Most ranchers are good stewards, so not only do our livestock flourish, but, uh, but the wildlife flourish. Well, working ranches are the most important piece of the conservation puzzle, in my opinion. Those areas provide habitat connectivity between mountain ranges for species like grizzly bears. They also provide the winter range for ungulates moving out of the mountains. Ranchers do a lot that people don't understand to try and coexist and, and try to accommodate wildlife, but it doesn't come without cost to them. If elk ever get into a stackyard, 3,000 elk can eliminate a stackyard in the winter, and that's crushing. The grizzly bears have really gotten to a point where they're detrimental to our survival. If, if working ranches can't remain viable, they're going to be possibly sold to an out-of-state buyer, or they're going to be subdivided. That's what the main problem is, for especially grizzly bears. So if we don't get a handle around this and manage this properly, we could lose what could be the greatest success story in conservation history. Well, I'm Rick Sandrew. Malou Anderson Ramirez. John Anderson. Teeth Martinell and I've grown up here on my family's ranch. We're standing on my family ranch in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Third generation rancher in the Ruby Valley. Just outside of Twin Bridges, Montana on the Jefferson River. You can probably see in the background. I've been Montana rancher my whole life. I was born and raised in ranching, not far from here. Yes, yeah, so from June to October, we basically are with the cattle almost every day. We probably ride five days a week, and we have predators. <laughs> We have a lot of predators. I think historically this has always been really pristine grizzly bear habitat. And plus this is a migration corridor, so there's a lot of bears that just will come in and out of this area. We've had most of our grizzly pred predators activity out on the more open prairies and hills and uh, where it's either grassland, but a lot of times hills covered with sagebrush and um, they definitely are moving through that area and hunting in those areas. and. Uh, they're pretty important to them, for sure. We're stewards of the land that we manage, and we take that very seriously. All ranchers love the land, and they love the animals that live on it. We work with the grizzly bear a lot these days. There's not one rancher I know that wants the grizzly bears to be extinct. And a lot of people think that ranchers hate grizzly bears. That's not the case. We just want to make sure we're not the ones that end up extinct. Working ranch lands are kind of the last puzzle piece um, for really conserving this um, stellar ecosystem of the greater Yellowstone. Um, about 75% of the land area here is in public hands, but um, the 25% that's privately owned is concentrated in the high productivity river valley bottoms. So those areas provide habitat connectivity between mountain ranges for species like grizzly bears, wolverine, lynx that need to be able to move between those mountain ranges. They also provide the winter range for ungulates moving out of the mountains. They're also the grassland and sagebrush habitat. Private lands are where elk winter. 80, in our region, Region 3, Southwest Montana, 80% elk winter range is on private lands. 
These herds are, are phenomenal. I've counted herds that were three miles long and two miles wide. Uh, see them spread out across the landscape like that, it's an absolute Serengeti. And so these elk are out there trying to find places where the snow has blown free and uh, where they can access forage and, uh, and survive the winter until the next spring. To me, those cattle are the viable business that's providing that land to be able to stay open. When the rancher can't make a living on that land, they're going to have to sell it to somebody who's probably going to want to develop it or do something else to have a better chance of making money at it. To keep these large landscapes intact, and in order to keep large landscapes intact, we have to keep private land ownership where it is at this point um, because obviously once a producer no longer can make it and goes bankrupt or sells off then obviously those that land gets sold off in chunks um, fences get put up um, migration corridors absolutely change or are completely decimated uh, wildlife habitat then goes away um, soils are no longer being built uh, and native you know it's just a you know cascade effect down Long hours and short pay is not a big incentive for young people to get into agriculture. Are we doing my grandson a favor by, even if we gave him the ranch, could he make it work? Things are getting more expensive, machinery is more expensive, while our, our prices are kind of remaining static. And so consistently we lose five, six, seven, eight calves a summer to either grizzly bears and wolves or both. Our bigger concern is the safety of our people that are out there taking care of those cattle because it's a really dangerous job. One time they identified 11 different grizzly bears on our, just on our permit. Usually when we come into contact with grizzlies, it's over food source. They're on a carcass. Um, usually they're in hyperphagia where their metabolism has kicked up and they're wanting to just eat as much as they can before they go into, hi into hibernation. And so that just kind of compounds the danger that we witness out here versus something like in the park. I definitely believe they're part of our ecosystem here and I'm not against the bear at all. So if people are really concerned about the well-being of the grizzly bear, they should be very supportive of working ranchers because the working ranch lands provide the wildlife corridors for the bears to be able to travel from one mountain range to the other and reproduce and, and spread around like they were intended to do. If you have these ranches chopped up into subdivisions, uh, the animals aren't gonna be able to move freely through that landscape anymore. Uh, we often uh, forget to ask the question of why working ranch lands work so well in this ecosystem and why, uh, why that um, provides such an opportunity for conservation. And, and to answer that, you have to really think about the evolutionary history of this landscape. Uh, this was um, buffalo territory. These grasslands co-evolved with the bison. It's a keystone species that fundamentally changes the ecosystems where they exist. There's a large um, body of science that shows that when you remove grazing from these systems, plant species diversity, animal species diversity declines. These systems depend on that grazing and it turns out that cattle are um, a pretty good substitute. It's not the equivalent of bison, and so it's not replacing what wild bison did. But I think it's, uh, it's easy for me to say, and I think most range ecologists would agree, that these systems are better with cattle on the landscape than if you removed all grazers completely.
I feel like right now the scales are a little bit tipped um, unfairly. I think that the ranchers are bearing more of the cost of coexistence with wildlife and providing these, um, these services that the public is benefiting from. About five years ago, we started weaning our calves about a month ahead of when we used to do it. We started doing that because we were losing a significant number of calves and they just wouldn't come home to the, when we weaned them. And uh, since we've been doing that, we've cut our losses significantly. Um, range riders really, there are many different ways range riders help the situation um, from uh, most importantly is finding carcasses so that producers can get compensated for those losses. As you might imagine that can get kind of challenging depending on where the carcass is in a landscape like this. We um, move our cattle not only to better our soils with electric fence but to also keep them safer, to keep them bunched together. We all have camera traps so that we can start to individualize some of these bears, understand their movement a little bit better and it's really helped and plus it helps the community come together. We're talking about things that we've never talked about before. Yeah and we also always try to go in horseback and that helps a lot too. We always make sure that we have dogs, which can make it a little difficult sometimes when you're having to doctor cattle. Those dogs range out, and if there's bears, uh, the bears are going to think twice about taking on eight dogs. When tourists leave Yellowstone Park, if they've not seen a grizzly bear in Yellowstone Park, the rangers will tell them, oh, well, then you should go to Tom Minor Basin. Now it's viral. You, you, know, you Google where to find a grizzly bear, and this is one of the first that comes up. And so in the evenings now we're seeing, especially in September, upwards of 50 to 100 cars driving up this one-way dirt road. All of the wildlife that we have on our place is uh, very enjoyable to us, but we don't uh, realize any money from that. Uh, we basically provide habitat for animals to flourish and, and a lot of people just stop by here to, to watch the, the wildlife. But uh, that's something that maybe we could get compensated for that would help us uh, maintain our, our working ranches. Well, another, another thing we get up here a lot is uh, swans. So I believe by working together, we can have grizzly bears and we can have working ranches. But, but there's gotta be that balance. If that land can stay viable through a, a business operation to keep it intact, that, to me that's the best opportunity there is for being able to promote that landscape the way that we'd like to see it. When I look at the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, what does success in the future look like in this area? And, and that's an easy one to answer, that it looks a lot like what it does right now.